What happens when someone, let's say a man, who in his early life feels so utterly isolated from everyone and everything around him that all he feels for his fellow mankind is utter hatred and contempt? Throw into the mix an unhealthy obsession with death, decay and graveyards. What is it when someone feels more at home in a mausoleum than in the family home? Welcome to the world of Nicolas Klaus, the Vampire of Paris. Hi guys, just wanted to quickly drop in and let you all know that Sonny is doing fantastically well after he had his 11 tooth taken out. The abscess that he had has cleared up perfectly and he's now as good as new. I would also like to say a big thank you to everyone who sent good wishes to him. He loves you all for your love and concern. Anyway, let's get back into the video. Hi guys, welcome to or welcome back to Sunny's Mysterious Stories. This week sees our third episode of what I hope for you are some pretty amazing dark stories. So if you're into true crime, both solved and unsolved, or perhaps stories with a little bit of a paranormal bent to it, then you're in the right place. Today's story takes us across the English Channel to France, more accurately Paris which is recognised as being one of the most beautiful and romantic cities in the world. So, enough of my waffle, and let's get into the story. For the most part, the internet can be a wonderful thing or place. A place to find information on pretty much any topic, somewhere that you can find the purchase you've been looking at to make, somewhere that you can manage your online finances, and also a place where you can meet friends, both old and new, and even lovers. Unfortunately, we have all heard of those cases in which killers have used the internet to find their victims, luring them to a secluded area before murdering them in cold blood. Now, this is the same sort of scenario in the case of the more than aptly named Vampire of Paris, better known as Nicholas Clow. The only thing that was different with this case was that his crimes were all planned and carried out using a pre-internet message board called Minicel. Like I said, most people would use the web for their online shopping, chatting with friends, catching up on news stories, events and stuff like that, while some would scout out for their next potential victim. Internet crimes are truly nothing new, between identity theft email fizzing, scams, people looking for murder victims and on the other occasion even vice versa. It's well known that you should always take caution when you're dealing with complete strangers online. So this is the harrowing story of how one man that worked in a morgue went on a truly dark path that included necrophilia, cannibalism and eventually onto murder. So. Who exactly is Nicholas Clow? Well, Nicholas Clow was born on March 22nd, 1972 in the African nation of Cameroon. His father was a French citizen who worked in a bank and was often sent with his family to foreign countries for prolonged periods of time. Now, I couldn't really find anything about his mother, but what I did find says that she was pretty much emotionally absent and that she showed little or no interest in her son. Though Nico, and that's what I'm going to call him for the rest of this video, well, Nico was a little too young to remember his time in Cameroon, but he does remember he and his family moving to London in England when he was about five years old, and then between the ages of seven to twelve, he remembers moving to the southernmost part of Paris in France. Nico recalls his childhood as being pretty much normal, but does admit to being very withdrawn, and he only had a few real friends. He's known to have actually admitted himself that he was very lonely as a child, 
and because he had no siblings, he spent most of his time alone in his room. So whilst his parents were exceedingly kind to their child and gave him everything he needed, Nico said he never really felt like he had a strong close bond with them. It said that they never really hugged or kissed Nico, opting to just leave him to his own devices. Eventually, Nico grew up to be rather emotionally cold. He would go on to not feel any empathy for other people, feeling indifferent to them. An extremely critical moment in his life came when he was just 10 years old. You see, he was having an argument with his grandfather for some reason or another, and during the argument, his grandfather suddenly died as a result of a cerebral embolism. Nico said that he always felt as though his family had held him responsible for the death. The result of his grandfather dying in front of him made him become obsessed with physical death. From that day forward, he became fascinated with burial sites, wakes, and rather strangely, the atmosphere of morgues. As his odd fascination with death and the occult began, he would spend hours reading books about vampires and werewolves. He found himself especially fascinated with a photo of the statue of the Sumerian demon Pazuzu, which he had found in one of his parents' books that they had acquired whilst in England. To Nico, it symbolised something extremely ancient and powerful, and it was something that he found he respected. That very same statue was used in the movie The Exorcist, which only strengthened his interest in the occult. Not long after Nico's grandfather's death, his mother began having nightmares where she would wake up screaming that Nico was trying to kill her with his mind. She even went as far as accusing him of having supernatural powers. Soon after, she was hospitalised and for the rest of her life she would be terrified of her own son. This all just gave Nico another morbid fascination and obsession. By the age of 12, he and his family relocated to Lisbon in Portugal where they remained for four years. And so, whilst the settings may have changed, Nico's obsession remained the same. None of his classmates shared his strange interests and so, once again, he remained without friends. But this only increased his feeling of loneliness and he also began to feel an utter hatred for everyone around him. By the time he was 16, he and his father had moved back to Paris. Again, I don't know what the situation is with his mother, so I'm just not going to mention her. Nico claimed that as far back as he could remember, he had been obsessed with graveyards. It wasn't too long before he knew every graveyard in Paris like the back of his hand. Between 1990 and 1993, he would spend all of his spare time in the graveyards. Just like a botanist would study plants and flowers, so he too would examine rusty locks and evaluate the weight of the grave's cement lids. Mausoleums were his favourites. He would peek through mausoleum windows trying to see inside. Some would even be decorated with furniture, paintings or statues. Before too long, Nico began working on ways in which he could get a better view. It wasn't too long until Nico had crafted his own lock picking tools, with his favourite being an L-shaped key. It is said that one of the mausoleum's locks was too rusty to pick, then he would just use a crowbar or enter through a window. Once he had gained access, he was said to have felt like an emperor reigning in hell. Whilst he was there, the place would become his kingdom. Quite often, he would enter a mausoleum during the day, only to resurface during the night when the gates to the cemetery were closed and he could continue with his activities without the fear of being discovered. It's been said that it wasn't too long until Nico became dissatisfied with simply lurking in graveyards and breaking into mausoleums. It just wasn't satisfying his desires. His fantasies fast became sadistic blueprints, tools for fulfilling his new cravings. It's a matter of speculation as to whether this change in him 
began at this point in time or if it was years earlier. But what is clear is that Nikos believed he had stepped up to an entirely new level. In one interview that he gave, Nico told how he just woke up one day feeling a sinister urge to dig up a corpse and mutilate it. So, he got a few supplies together, a small crowbar, a pair of pliers, black candles and a pair of surgical gloves. And he made his way to Passy Cemetery in Paris. He had really thought this one out as he had a particular grave in mind. It was a small mausoleum, which was the burial site of a family of Russian immigrants from the 1917 revolution. It took him a better part of an hour to remove one of the coffins from its stone casing, but he did not let that put him off. After examining the casket for a little while, he proceeded to unscrew the coffin lid. Man, I'm not gonna lie to you, but the stench that must have escaped from that from the inside of that coffin must have been absolutely awful. Nico went on to stab the corpse over and over with the screwdriver. It was said that he'd stabbed the woman's corpse over 50 times. Nico even reported that when he came out of his frenzy, his forearms were totally covered with corpse slime. Truly horrific. I just do not know what to say about it. After having violated his first grave, Nico spent pretty much all of his free time searching the cemetery for new graves to desecrate. It was a pattern that is said to have continued right up until the moment of his arrest. When he was 20 years old, Nico joined the military where he would learn how to clean and repair weapons. The only thing was he found his new lifestyle to be extremely boring. And the only way that he seemed to be able to combat the boredom was by fantasizing about murdering people. In fact, it was something that he got great satisfaction from. Well, Nico would only last for one year in the military before he decided to move on to something new. And you would never guess what his next career option was. Nico thought that he would make a great mortician. Yeah, I know. So, in 1993, there was only one local school for embalming and they actually turned down his application. I don't know why that was, but I'm assuming that he didn't put anything too creepy or suspicious on his application. But that was not going to stop him from living his dream. Oh no. So he ended up getting a job working at St. Vincent de Paul Hospital, which is also in Paris. It is actually a hospital for children, which is just totally chilling to begin with. But it was the only way that he could do what he wanted to do for a living, and it would also allow him to encounter corpses. The job that he was given was a morgue attendant, but he didn't stay there for too long, and by the December of 1993, he took on a position of morgue attendant and stretcher bearer at St. Joseph Hospital, which is also in Paris. There, his duties would involve helping out with autopsies, cleaning up the morgue slabs, and also helping to prep the bodies for their wakes. Now, I found this next bit a little bit strange, and I don't know, just slightly worried maybe? You see, most of the autopsies were actually done by the morgue attendants, i.e. people like Nico himself. He would do everything from the Y-shaped incision, the cutting of the ribs at the joints, and the opening of the skull with an electric saw. I mean, the pathologists just seemed to be in charge of dissecting the organs and placing them into boxes. Nico would be left alone with the bodies after the autopsy was over so that he could do the stitches, which were one of his specialities apparently. Okay, so I just want to give you a little heads up here as to this next little bit. I mean, it's not pretty. So as I said, Nico would be left alone with the bodies, left to his own devices, sewing up the bodies. But he would also begin to cut small pieces of flesh and muscle and begin eating it. But it wouldn't be just anybody's body that he would chow down on. Oh no, no, no. You see, he had spoken to some guy who was a butcher 
and he had told Nico that meat always tastes better three or four days after death. So Nico would always check out people's medical files first. Now, this was something that Nico had always dreamed of doing and now he would have the opportunity to do it on a regular basis. So, time's going by and Nico is eating pieces of loved ones' bodies and not giving a care in the world about anything. At times, he would take pieces of select meats home with him where he could cook and eat them, although his preference was to eat the meat raw. According to Nico, it tasted like tartar steak or carpaccio. Note to oneself, never to eat those foods again, ever. He apparently said that the big muscles of the thighs and back were particularly good, but that the meat in the breasts were no good, as it's really only fat. When asked what went through his mind the first time he indulged in his cannibalistic fantasy, all he said to himself was, wow, now I'm a cannibal, cool. Again, I'm not really sure how to respond to that other than, okay, so that happened. There was another side to Nico's job at St. Joseph's Hospital, and that involved working in the digestive surgery unit. One of the duties that he was responsible for was delivering blood bags from the hospital's blood bank to the surgery room. Before too long, Nico would notice how there would often be some blood bags left over and eventually he devised a scheme in which he would rip off the sticker, making it appear as if it had been opened, and then he would stash the bag away in his hospital staff locker. At the end of his shift, he would smuggle it out from his locker, take it home where he would begin cooling it in his fridge. As soon as it reached the desired temperature, he would begin mixing the blood with powder proteins, or on some occasions, human ashes before finally drinking the concoction. So, because the blood contained no plasma, he would thicken it up with this concoction, otherwise it would be extremely thin. So now we come to the morning of October 4th, 1994, and Nicholas Clough finally decided that it was time to take his fantasies to the next level. Yeah, there was another level. And this fantasy was a real doozy. You see, in his mind, he believed that this particular fantasy that he had would take him to a level far greater than that of petty grave robbing and corpse mutilation. He had been biding his time, but now he was finally ready to cross the line. But it was a line that, once crossed, would irrevocably change a man forever. All he needed was his victim. So he spent the entire morning searching for his victim and it didn't matter to him who it was. Not age, not race, not sex, nothing mattered. Absolutely nothing. All he was looking for was death. Nothing more, nothing less. By the early afternoon he decided to try his luck on Minitel, which was an early form of the internet. Remember, this was the early 1994. It wasn't too long before Nico found himself talking to a man named Thierry Bisonnier. I probably have butchered that name and I'm so sorry. The conversation soon moved on from casual chit chat to bondage and S&M. A little while later, they decided to meet up. Thierry gave out his address to Nico. Remember, it was a different time back then. People were far more trusting and naive. Thierry, after all, was looking for a relationship of sorts. Little did he know, but sex was the last thing on Nico's mind. So, back in the mid-90s, it was customary practice within the gay community to meet like-minded people using Minitel, as it was quick and easy to use. Nico obviously realised that this was an uncomplicated way for him to find victims without any witnesses. Plus, he had the guarantee of remaining anonymous, as there was no possibility of tracing the conversations that they had had back in those early days of the internet. Nico had agreed to meet his victim, Theory, at noon at Theory's apartment, 
When Thierry answered the door at noon, Nico gave him the fake name that he had used on Minitel. As Thierry let him into his apartment, Nico pulled out his single shot 22 caliber handgun and pointed it at Thierry's eye. After a few moments of silence passed by, Nico just went ahead and pulled the trigger. Thierry fell silently to the floor. Then, feeling curious, Nico decided to explore the man's apartment to see what it was like. When he returned to where Thierry was lying on the floor, slowly bleeding out, Nico realised that he was somehow still alive, so he took the time to reload his gun and shot him one more time, this time striking him at the back of his head. He reloaded his gun one more time and shot Thierry a few more times. A few moments later, he went into the kitchen, found himself some cookies, then went back to where his victim lay and sat in the corner just eating the cookies, just watching him. When he was finished, Nico decided to make a quick getaway. So, he shot Thierry one more time, this time in the back. And for good measure, he picked up a very heavy plant pot and smashed it on his head, crushing it a bit. As he went through the apartment, wiping away possible fingerprints, he ended up stealing a credit card, a wallet with identification, a checkbook, a driver's license, and an alarm clock, and an answering machine. Bit random, but that's what he took. Then he finally left. Thierry Bosinia's parents had been trying to contact him for a few days, but to no avail. So they went to his apartment in the hopes of finding him, but sadly, they were only to be met with a grisly scene. So I could find barely any information about Thierry, as there wasn't much press coverage, and during Nico's trial, there was a blackout in place on the press, meaning that no members of the public or the press were allowed into the courtroom. It's been floated that the reason for this is that Thierry's family didn't want the life of their loved one to be exposed in public, and that there were elements in the case that were deemed too sensitive for the general public. What was known was that Thierry was a 30-year-old restaurateur and part-time classical musician who was involved in a steady relationship with an older man. Brigade criminal investigator Gilbert Thiel was one of the first investigators to arrive on the scene. As shocking as this scene appeared, it did nothing to deter Thiel as this was unfortunately nothing new to him. Thierry was just one of many gay men that were murdered every year in Paris. In fact, that month alone there had already been seven others in almost identical or near identical circumstances. According to Agence France Presse, which is basically a French international news agency that was headquartered in Paris, Homosexual murders represented about a third of all murders in the Paris area. All the victims shared a similar profile and similar habits, which included a very liberal view on sexuality, which incorporated risks as a part of the ultimate pleasure. During the early 1990s, the large majority of these encounters began with messages on Minicel. According to Thierry Bissonnier's autopsy report, the first bullet from Nico's gun entered the eyeball and stopped short of hitting the brain. The following rounds crushed against his scroll, except one, which slightly penetrated his brain. The final shot entered through Thierry's back, piercing his heart, causing almost immediate death. For the investigators, there were really only two questions they needed answers to. Who and why? In all honesty, Nico would more than likely have gotten away with the murder had it not been for a single crucial mistake. You see, in mid-October, Nico tried to forge one of Thierry's blank bank checks. He had tried to purchase a VCR. For all of you young subscribers, a VCR is a video cassette player. It's what we used in the days before DVDs. So when Nico was asked for identification, he presented the shop clerk with Thierry's driving license, which he had attempted to forge by inserting his own picture. 
but the swindle was quickly ended when the clerk compared the signatures on the driving license and the cheque. But before the police could arrive, Nico had made his escape. But this is when the search really began. And now they had his picture. On October 15th, 1994, Nico Clow was arrested in front of the Moulin Rouge cabaret bar following an altercation with a random woman. Thankfully, the police recognised him from his photograph on Thierry's forged driving licence. When Nico was first taken into custody, the police noticed that among the many occult-themed tattoos were the words serial killer tattooed down the back of both arms. And across his abdomen was the word predator, proudly spelt out. Detectives were able to catch a glimpse into the world that was so warped that it was beyond comprehension. It was the world of someone whose mind was completely consumed with violence and death and necrophilia and cannibalism. It was the world that the man sitting in front of them felt completely at home with. That man was, of course, Nicolas Clau. It was while she was in custody and shown ballistic evidence that he then confessed to the murder. As the investigators continued, his grave robbing, stealing of bones and mutilation of mummified corpses became common knowledge. When Nico was asked why he had stolen blood bags in his refrigerator, he simply admitted that he drank the blood on a regular basis. He also informed the detectives that he had an incredibly special diet and then went on to describe his mortuary job and cannibalism rituals. But why did he begin to kill? And was there more than one murder victim? The murder investigation itself was pretty much centered on the motive and whether there was premeditation involved. At first, Nico tried to claim that his motive was pure robbery, but the cold and calculated modus operandi that he used as well as the completely unnecessary overkill, along with the careful removal of his fingerprints, all went to prove that something far more sinister was involved, indicating a clearly senseless yet premeditated murder. Because the victim was a gay man, investigators did wonder if, first, there was some sort of sexual component to the case. As it turned out, there was no sexual component, other than the online conversations between the two men. Nico had simply wanted death, and the victim had just been an easy target. Nico was sent to a place called Fleury Mirogis, which is a jail that was a remand centre. A place where convicts are locked up before their trial. It wasn't uncommon for convicts to be there for three or four years before going to court, and upon conviction you could wait up to a year before they would find you a cell in a prison. The French judicial system was painfully slow at times. Over the next two years, a court ordered a team of specialised psychiatrists and psychologists to examine Nico. Dozens of tests were carried out which revealed Nico as having a borderline psychotic personality disorder. In addition to this, the experts also diagnosed him as suffering from necrophilia and sexual sadism. However, they didn't detect any psychotic or neuropsychotic disorders which could have interfered with his discernment or control of his actions. At one point, Detective Thiel asked Nico for a reconstruction of the murder. So, he was taken to the victim's apartment where Nico showed the detective his version of events. Nico claimed that he had accidentally fired the first shot and so continued shooting until the victim was dead. It was a version of events that Nico would stick to until the trial. Like I said earlier, the first motive that Nico had given them was robbery. But when he realised that he could benefit from a diminished responsibility plea, he came up with another motive. He went on to claim that he had had an argument with a homosexual man in a section of the cemetery that he claimed was his on the morning of the murder. It was because of this argument, Nico claimed, that he decided to contact the homosexual man on Minotaur, in his words, to scare him and get his revenge. Apparently this explanation pleased the psychiatrists and they granted Nico diminished responsibility under Rule 242, a linear B of the penal code. 
However, I must point out that the documents in this case do not actually confirm this. In December 1996, Thiel closed the preliminary investigation when he decided that there was more than enough evidence for a trial. What's interesting to note is that in the middle of the preliminary investigation, which lasted for around two years, Thiel was promoted to the anti-terrorist squad following the 1995 series of attacks in Paris by Islamic terrorists. So, while he was no longer required to continue working on the case, Thiel chose to stay on, and so all remaining interrogations took place in his new office at the anti-terrorist squad headquarters. Some speculate that it was because Thiel believed that Nico was responsible for other similar murders and didn't want to lose the opportunity to gather additional evidence. Nicole Klaus's trial began on May 9, 1997 at the Cour des de Paris. I'm sure that's the courts in Paris. The nine-member jury had already been selected by the presiding judge and Nico's defence lawyer, Irene Terrell, entered a plea of not guilty. The prosecution's opening move was to shock the jury with grisly photographs of the crime scene and of Nico's apartment. The purpose of the photographs was to make a parallel between the murder and the environment in which Nico lived. The prosecution charged that Nico had voluntarily killed Thierry and that they felt as though they had acknowledged that it was indeed premeditated. They next presented the jury with a list of offences that he committed during the act. Theft of his checkbook and credit card wallet driving license, alarm clock and answering machine. The prosecutor implied that the items were stolen prior to the murder. They then pointed out the use of the forged license and the forged check, which included the falsifying of Theory's signature. And whilst all of this was damning on its own, the prosecution then attempted to establish that this murder was in fact one in a series which had taken place in Paris during 1994. The prosecution called Nico a death addict and a real life vampire. Their theory was that Nico was a copycat of a serial killer, Remy R. The main testimony in their serial murders theory came from two of the leading investigators who worked on the case. One of them, Inspector Garcin, testified that even though there was no solid evidence against Nico, he nonetheless fitted the psychological profile of a serial murderer. The other claim made was that there were witnesses in bars where other murder victims hung out and that placed Nico at those places. Regardless of the prosecution's serial killer theory, there simply was not enough physical evidence to back it up. Jurors deliberated for just three hours. Nicolas Clark was found guilty of premeditated murder, armed robbery, fraudulent use of a bank cheque, falsification of the driver's licenses photo, and an attempt to defraud the retailer of the VCR. That was his final downfall. He was sentenced to just 12 years. Can you believe that? He was never convicted of grave robbery or mutilation of the corpses or the theft of the bags containing the blood. And after serving just seven years and four months of a 12 year sentence, Nikos Klaus was released from prison on March 22nd, 2002. And that my friends is the story of the real life vampire Nicolas Klo. Firstly, one of the things that I really cannot get my head around is the fact that after everything he had gotten up to, and I'm not even talking about the murder that he committed, but after everything else he did, he was only put away for 12 years. And then there is the premeditated murder. You would expect him to get a life sentence. And the man is now walking the streets as a free man, just like the rest of us. It's just totally unbelievable, but that's just the way the world works. We might not agree with the sentence, but this is why I feel so helpless sometimes. After his release, Nico gave many, many interviews to different publications. In one interview, Nico said that he did not believe that parenting played a significant role in forming the mind of a child, and he went on to claim that it was something 
that he'd always been wanting to do when talking of his loss to kill and eat victims. He also went on to say that he was, in fact, the very essence of evil. Well guys, I'd love to know what you all think of our friend Nico here. He's certainly a real character, isn't he? Why don't you leave a comment in the comment section and let me know what you all think. I really hope that you liked the video. If you did, then please hit the like button and consider subscribing to the channel with your bell notifications turned on so that you get notified every time a video gets uploaded. Until the next video guys, please take care of yourselves and each other. See you next time. Bye bye.